This is a talk about Sorbet. Sorbet is a type system and a type checker that we've built at Stripe for Ruby. And in this talk, we'll discuss why would we do that and how did we do that. So first of all, who am I? I'm Dmitry. Um, I've earned a PhD in compiler construction working with Martin Odersky. My PhD thesis was Dottie, which is going to be called Scala 3. And now I'm working on developer tooling at Stripe, which includes everything from processes, core standard libraries, code coding conventions, CI, everything. My work is to make sure that engineers at Stripe have the most productive life of their most productive years of their career there. Here's the outline of this talk. And during the talk, please at any moment feel free to stop me and ask questions. I'm happy to answer all of them. Uh, we'll start with the context in which this was possible, which is for Stripe. So, okay, so Stripe is a platform that developers, external developers, use to accept payments. If you want to accept payments on the internet, uh, there are a lot of things that need to be handled there to do it correctly. You want to make sure you're compliant. You want to make sure that you're correctly doing things with credit cards and you're not leaking them. That's hard, and companies use us to solve this problem for you. We run uh, in 32 countries, and millions of businesses worldwide use us. Uh, there are billions of dollars processing every year through Stripe, and more than 80% of Americans adults bought something in Stripe in 2017. We have hundreds of people in 10 offices around the world. Customers report more developer productivity after deploying Stripe, and as always, we're hiring. Now, Ruby at Stripe. Ruby is a primary language used at Stripe. Uh, it's an enforced subset of Ruby. You cannot use everything from Ruby. You can use the things that we consider to be sane in a company where there are a lot of engineers. We want to have our code base be maintainable and more uniform. And we're not using Rails. We're using our own frameworks, our own Chakra DM, our own ORM layer, our own things that we believe work best for us. Most of our product is in a monorepo, and that's intentional. Uh, we believe that you get benefits by having a single versioning scheme while having clear notion of dependencies and while being able to do all the changes in the same repo and the same PR. Majority of the code lives in 10 microservices, and majority of new code goes into them. Now, scale of engineering and stripes, again, hundreds of engineers, thousands of commits per day, million lines of codes. Now, in this environment, what was the problem that the type system was supposed to solve? Here's an email of, from pre-survey times at Stripe. This was a discussion about some specific user feature. So as a discussion happened, the discussion was that the most common way it breaks is by seeing something called no method error in production. No method error is what happens in Ruby if you try to invoke a method on a class which doesn't have this method. Like, for example, this will happen if you have the wrong class, not the one that you expected. You expect it to have a string, you have an integer. Or you mistyped a method. The, this is the right class, but you're just calling a method that doesn't exist in it. And this was the most common kind of error, the most common kind of error seen in production. And the second one is name errors. This is slightly different, but it's on the same vein. Name errors is when you refer to classes, not to methods, while having typos in them. So though at the time, those were the most common problems described in production. And in order to address them, we went to, towards building a type system and deploying it at Stripe. Here are the design principles that we had behind it in order to make it work well specifically at Stripe. The first one was explicitness. We want to write type annotations. In fact, we see them beneficial. The reason for this being that they make code readable and predictable. As somebody who is not writing this code, but rather reading this code, it makes it easier for you to understand what to expect of this method. What we mean by non-explicit here, the alternative that we could have chosen is to not write type annotation, but have a type system that's smart enough to figure it on its own. Do it across methods. For example, how Scala does it in particular for return time. We've intentionally decided not to do this because in a company that's big where majority of people who re read somebody else's code, it's beneficial to understand not what it does now, but what was it expected to do, to have explicit intent and make sure that implementation fulfills this intent rather than trying to back solve the intent from implementation. The second one is effectively a counterbalance to the previous one. While we want our users to write signatures for methods and describe boundaries this way, we don't want this to feel burdensome for this. In particular, when you're writing code inside the method, we can actually figure out majority of types for you. 
For example, here in the very first line, a is an integer. We don't want you to write that it's an integer. We can figure it out on our own. Similarly, on the second line, it's a string. But here, we, if you want, we allow you to declare that this is a string. We don't require you to do this, but if you want to be explicit about it, you have an option to do this. Next one is more of internal rather than user visible design constraint. We want the type system to be simple but not simpler. And what by this mean what we mean by this is we want it to be as simple as possible while fulfilling the needs at Stripe. The, here's the list of features in order they were added to the type system. The reason for those was that every next feature was added not because we thought that this feature is fancy or because we always wanted to implement this feature. It's because we saw real code at Stripe that's super common, not one method, hundreds of methods, methods written by hundreds of engineers that need this thing to be modeled. Based on this, we started iterating with the minimal set of features, adding features one by one, building the exact set that was needed to support Stripe code base that pre-existed before that time. And then the next requirement was we didn't build a type system for Stripe at the time. We built a type system that we wanted to live for a long time and continue delivering impact, which means we want to make decisions that scale with size of engineering, both size of engineer of our users and size of internal team who builds the type checker. We also wanted to make sure we can address the needs of different users at Stripe. Different people need different amount of rigor. Somebody is working on an experimental feature and they have still no clue what it should do and they don't know what design it has, which infrastructure it has, which structure it has. They want to go YOLO. Somebody wants to make sure that this code is super rigid, doesn't have a single problem, and can be proven to be correct. And you, in real world, you can make both of them perfectly happy, but you can make of them, make both of them at least not be grumpy at you to make sure that you can both prove majority of the usefulness without being constrained of somebody who wants to go YOLO, and you can also allow some people some degree of going YOLO. The next one is to, we want to scale with code base size. From our experience, majority of the code bases of big companies, Stripe, Google, Facebook, grow non-linearly with time. There's an argument whether that's a cubic function or whether that's exponential function. In practice, it's a function that grows super fast. So we need to make sure that the tool we're building can be fast and will still provide pleasant experience for users. And it also allows our users to isolate the complexity of the code base, where they will no longer need to know the entire code base and understand actions in a distance, rather than they, this tool can be used to create those packages or interfaces, those abstractions that will make it easier for users to reason about their code. And we also wanted to make sure that the code that our project scales with time. And by this we mean uh, if there are some decisions that can be much easier addressed early in the project, they would better address earlier rather than being postponed. So to give you some of the like, numbers for them, the most easiest one to assess here is performance. Our current performance is around 100 care lines per second per CPU core. And we scale linearly up to 64 cores, didn't, didn't test further. Uh, for comparison, to give some baseline, if you compare us with Java C, we're around 10x faster than Java C per core. And we're around 100x faster than existing tools that use Ruby, which is Rubocop, which only does syntax checking. It doesn't do any kind of modeling semantically. From our experience so far today, our tool is the fastest way at Stripe, at Shopify, at Coinbase, and all of those companies to get iterative feedback. We'll go into this deeper, but the short summary is, is today integrated in IDE, and the current latency for response is milliseconds. Yeah. Uh, the next one is compatible with Ruby. We did not intend to deviate from Ruby, either semantics or syntax. We want to continue using the tools that Ruby has. We want to continue using the standard IDEs. We uh, want to continue getting the value and want to provide the value for other companies. Uh, the whole point here is to improve the existing Ruby code base rather than creating a new code base that might have been following better rules. So we want to be able to adopt it in existing code base, adopt it incrementally, and thus code as Ruby. And going deeper into this one, we want to be able to adopt it gradually. Which, and what this means is different teams, different people, will be adopting it at a different pace. Thus we introduce something called strictness levels. The basic level does basic checks such as syntax level errors. And for all the code in our code base, 
even if you didn't ascribe a strictness level, we want it to at least parse. The next one is typed true, which enables basic type checking. It makes sure that for methods for which you have signature, they're correctly using its arguments, and when you're calling other methods, you're correctly using them results. Typed strict enforces that every existing method that you write in this code has a type signature. It effectively says that not only I want to check my bodies, I also want to make a promise to people who consume me that I'm going to fully annotate my entire interface, which means as somebody who is be using this, I'll get all the awesome features. I'll get jump to IDE, I have auto completion, I have jump to jump to definition, I have type at hover. This is the level that you want to use if you're providing the typed API for your users. And finally, this is level strong. This level disallows you to ever do something untyped. Every intermediary exception, not only the your API, everything that you do inside your implementations has to be typed and has to be verified whether it runs correctly statically. Have it, having all those in place, we went to adopt survey. As a team who is building this for internal usage, our goal is not to just build the tool, is to actually make, the, make sure that the tool is useful, which means make Stripe use it. So here's the time of line of adoption. It took us eight months to build the thing to a, to a level that we believed the, it's good enough, it's good enough to try to, to start adopting it widely. Actually, by that time, those eight months included pairing with two specific teams to make sure that their code base can be typed. The first team was the one who we believe has the simplest code base, and the second one was the one that we believe had the hardest code base. So we first wanted to make sure we can handle simple cases because we're just starting, and then we wanted to make sure we, we can handle the most complex ones. Then we spent seven months rolling this out, and then from there, we're working on editor and open source tool. Uh, now, what does this provide us? So I'll illustrate this on a bunch of examples of Ruby code. Uh, and I'll describe you what would happen before at Stripe and what would happen now. So if you were to have a look at this Ruby code, if you carefully see, there's a typo. The hello inside the main method is ma ma mistyped. One letter L is missing. If you were to run this, you will see this when running this. And in practice, if you didn't discover it yourself, it will take you either time to test CI, which means like 5 to 15 minutes to get feedback that you had a typo there, or maybe worse, you'll hear it later when you deploy the change, when the deploy will start failing and your deploy will be rolled back, or even worse, it won't fail instantaneously, but it will like fail subtly in some way and you'll get paged at 4 a.m. in production. So now, if you were to do this as Stripe now, you won't be able to even commit this. Uh, you will get this error and it will tell you that you, there is no such thing as hello. Uh, this is true for 100% of code at Stripe. 100% of code at Stripe currently cannot have a typo in a class name. The next one is the method names. Similarly, in this one, somebody wanted to have a call method called greeting, but the call side forgot that the name is full and they just called greet for privacy. Similarly, in order to justify this error in baseline Ruby, you need to run this code and you'll see this error. Similarly, unless you found this error yourself, you'll find it either in tests or in deploy or worse in production. Now, with our thing, you can find it statically. You add the type annotation, type true, which means we'll start type checking your code. And then we'll be able to tell you that the method greet doesn't exist. I'm actually not showing the entire error message. The error messages actually include suggestions. What did you mean? They didn't fit in the slides, but we're also trying to be helpful in suggesting what was the thing that you wanted to do it. And you actually can pass us a flag to make us auto fix it. Uh, now, this is true for 85% of code is Stripe today. You may ask why. And for remaining 15% of the code, it takes effort to do this. For majority of the code that we migrated so far, we migrated it through automatic migrations, where we can go and fix common back bugs through automatic refactoring tools. We're a small team. When we started, we were three people, and we did majority of migration ourselves by building tools that automatically do restructuring and handle error cases for you. The remaining 15% now are mostly bespoke things, which are one-offs, and there's commonly like one or two errors that prevent file from being typed. 
increasingly this is code that when team goes and touches it, they will see the majority of features in their ID don't work because they only work in type files. And then they have a current in front of them to get it to type. And majority of the typing that has been happening over the last year is driven by users. I work in this file. I want the features that I'm used to working. So I'm just going to go and type it. Uh, and yes, this is more than just errors. Uh, you, it allows you to express intent. And expressing intent is super useful for when you have a big organization and you have a question of, you have a problem. Is this one team who doesn't understand how to use the API that another team provides? Or is this the team that provides the API who didn't handle the use case that the user expected to be handled? Here is an example of this. You have a method called do thing, very descriptive name. Can you pass string to it? Maybe. What happens if you pass nil to it, which is like Ruby speak for null in Java? Maybe it works. How would you expect it to work? Should it handle it? Who should handle it? Having type signatures change the way culture and collaboration between teams works. Now you explicitly describe your intent, and you know that the first one is OK. The method is expected to take a string. The second one is not. This is a good illustration of another thing, which is uh, we didn't want to postpone hard decision. One of the hard decisions that a lot of type systems postpone is whether nils inhabit every type. For example, in Java, nil is a varied string, and thus you can have errors in production when you pass nil. Kotlin is trying to fix it after the fact, and Scala 3 will be trying to fix this after the fact, but it's taking gears for them. For us, from start, we had this figured out. And our engineers don't know that this could have been a problem, that it could have been biting them and paging them from production at 4 a.m. Um, yep. So now, recap, what have we achieved? Uh, in 100% of files, we can catch uninitialized constants. In 80%, 5% of files, we can catch no method errors. And this is one more metric. In 75% of files, 75% of call sites, we know the specific method that you're calling. While this is not necessarily useful for type checking, this is the metric which tells you in how many locations can we do autocomplete. This tells you how many locations can you hover over it and will you show documentation about what's called there. We'll show you which type is being evaluated there. This is the metric that tells you that how useful this tool is as somebody who you're iteratively talking to as part of your development. It's like somebody who knows your code base really well and is able to answer every question about it in milliseconds rather than you taking time, going too deep into a thing, trying to figure out whether it handles something, or worse, like asking a team whether it's supposed to handle it, or worse, having this team be in a different continent in a different time zone and needing to wait 24 hours for it. Did I say we're in 10 offices? OK, now, all of this were just numbers, and there are numbers coming from somebody who chose this number, so they're metric. So they might be representative. Maybe I'm just trying to say that this is an awesome metric, but people actually hate it. So here are some screenshots of what users say. Uh, this is an example of a person who is describing that uh, they would use the type system to annotate the code that they rarely use. They touch it once every year or so. They always forget what it does. And going once there and describing what it was supposed to do makes it easier for them to go back to this code in a few years. Uh, here, a user is describing that they like the pair programming experience that they get from the tool. It's super useful that we can work on programs that are incomplete, programs that don't parse, programs that are still being written, which means developers can get early feedback and can adapt their design to be better modular, better readable, better in almost every way. In the past, if somebody was to write a method, that used to take either a string or an integer or an array or a Boolean, now if they were to write this as an explicit signature, they will feel bad. Because by before this, they could have like thought implicitly, I guess maybe it will work, but now they have to actually write this down, think about this, and now when they think about this, they, they're starting to question whether that's the right design. Similarly, as part of code review now, code reviewers see this. And if somebody is trying to introduce a method that like, serves 55 purposes and like, takes 55 different ki kinds of arguments in specific combinations, it's now explicit and people will rise neighbor. Uh, 
this is from a message from an early user who found a non-documented flag to enable hover. We're doing internal feature releases where some features for IDE are enabled for some users, some features are not, but by passing magical flags, you can enable for them for themselves. We grew a group of users that was back solving them in order to enable features. Uh, they also broke our metrics because uh, some of those features are not enabled because they're not fully stable, because they crash. Uh, yep. Yeah. So at some moment, we became so useful that people would prefer to enable features that like crash once every day because they're so useful despite crashing from time to time. So yep. Yeah. Uh, since then, we stopped having those flags because we want to make sure everything doesn't crash. We're fuzzing it. We're making. We're having metrics around it. Want to make being written in C++ crashes are scary because everything that you have a crash can be like arbitrary code execution, something like this. We don't intend to have crashes. And finally, it's fast. Uh, we have a million lines of code, and the, the tool completes in seconds. We're starting from scratch, and when you use it in an incremental mode in IDE, it's milliseconds. Depending what you do, it can be single digit milliseconds, can be a few more. more. OK, so now, what have we learned? So Survey is a powerful tool that feeds many needs. We have different users. Some of them are building new projects and new products. And they want to move fast and not yet figure out what their things are supposed to do and thus not care if they're broken. And we have some other users that are literally moving money, literally moving big piles of money. And they want to make sure that they move the money correctly because otherwise, well, big money is at stake. Uh, people love using survey. Originally, we had people who were pushing back. Originally, we had people who said something along the lines that survey is stopping them from doing the thing that they want. This commonly comes from two reasons. One is um, a lot of people came from teams that in previous companies that didn't grow as fast as we do. And they had a team of like five people, and they had a team of the same five people over four years. And thus, making it easy to onboard new engineers, have, having code that's easier to understand, was not something of a big constraint of theirs. While Stripe is growing fast, and thus, for us, it's super important to make sure people can easily understand the code. Majority of the code that Stripe is writing today will be maintained by more people as we grow. Second reason being that at the time they were complaining about this, just to be honest, Stripe uh, survey only had a stick. We're saying, like, you're wrong, your code is wrong, don't do this. Now, we also have candies. We can give you information about what does your code do. We can do refactorings for you. We can do jump to definition. In previous time, if you had a method with a common name uh, and you want to figure out which method with this name specifically are you calling, and they're like 100 methods with the same name in the code base. You need to figure out which of the hundreds is actually here. This was hard. Now you just comment click and you're there. Uh, and the final part, which is more of internal part, uh, this would, could not have been possible without automating the migration. The majority of typing, the majority of making the code actually follow the rules, fixing the common code patterns, fixing absence of null checks, or at least making them explicit, was made by our team. It wouldn't have been possible to stop product development and Stripe and ask everybody, please go type your code or rewrite your code to do something about this. The biggest value proposition is this happened underneath people, underneath majority of developers, without them needing to do much. They just was doing feature development, and in a year later, it became much easier to do feature development. It became much easier to maintain their code. So they love it. Uh, and this was the majority of their rollout. The rollout was the most important part. In retrospective, it was the super right call to have the very same team who developed the tool do the rollout because it allowed us to understand the user cases, allowed us to figure out what should actually be allowed and prohibited and which features do we need. And now we're in editor and OSS tool mode. Uh, we have integration with VS Code. We implement something called language server protocol. The reference implementation for it is VS Code, but uh, there are other implementations that work for it. Uh, people at Stripe have implemented implementation for VI. Uh, there is also an Emacs implementation lurking around. Yep, seems to be going well. Uh, 
we have errors, we have hover, uh, we have go to definition, we have autocomplete and documentation. As you're writing the method, you can see which methods have this name. You can also see the documentation for them and figure out which ones did you want. And also, in case you were staying from the previous talk here that was about WebAssembly, uh, this thing is written in C++. We compile it to WebAssembly and it runs in browser. So if you go to Surveyor.run, you can actually try it. Uh, unfortunately, with the way how it works, it doesn't show all the features in your phone. Specifically, autocomplete will not work because we're actually using a small version of VS Code there. And Microsoft did not intend to explore and int cover use cases of running VS Code on the phone. But if you go there from your VS Code, you'll have the basic experience. And if you go from your, com from your computer, you'll get autocomplete, you'll get jump to definition. You can also jump to definition to standard library. You can see which methods exist on standard Java or standard Ruby things. It's the way how a lot of people now like prototype small things because it allows them to like write a small algorithm and share it. Increasingly, we see people from both inside Stripe and inside Stripe use it as a replacement for Pasty because you can explore this code, you can understand it better, and it's easier to write it than in Pasty because autocomplete. And now, what's the current state of it? So we're collaborating closely with the Ruby core team. Ruby 3 will have types. We're settling out these details about what's going to be the syntax. Syntax might be slightly different, but Ruby 3 will have types, and that's awesome. Um, it's an open source. It has open sourced. We will open source it after having an extensive private beta with more than 40 companies adopting it. Um, at this moment, we know of a lot of big and small companies using it, both internally and for their recruitment, because it provides better user experience, and developers want to be productive. So having this as like we in our code base, you can use Surbase, Surbase Trendy. It's a good way to get people to enjoy and intend to work in your code base. You can check it out. Uh, the common like companies who have blocked about it include Coinbase, Shopify, Heroku, the big players in Ruby. And so just to go into closing, Survey has moved error discovery from test or production to development, which makes for much faster iteration tool for developers. It's open sourced. You can use it. It works with common Ruby code. Uh, I started by saying that we don't use Rails. Majority of your Ruby ecosystem does use Rails. And that's why I'm making so much emphasis on that other companies also do this, because they do use Rails, and they made it work for them. Specifically, uh, CZI, Ch Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, has created a huge project called Survey Rails, which adds enough things as extensions to Survey to support Rails code bases, and a lot of people are using those. And Docs are live at Survey.org. Thank you for listening to me. I would love your questions. Uh, do we have mics, or should I repeat the questions? Yes. I'll be repeating the questions, please. Um, so Ruby has a lot of really dynamic features, like whether I can reopen a class wherever I want, I can do instance eval, open struct, method missing, just to name a couple. Yep. Um, how does Sorbet deal with that? And or yeah. Okay. Um, so the question was, Ruby has a lot of dynamic features, including being able to define reopen a class, which is Ruby speak for define new methods into existing class or define new interfaces that class now implements despite the previous definition of it not saying it does. Or being able to change the scope so that you're evaluating something with your, this pointer, which is which Ruby's spoken self, which changes, which is called class eval and instance eval. And those are very dynamic features, very metaprogramming features, and how do we, do we and how do we support them? So the answer is twofold. First of all, there is always something called t.unsafe. There's always a way for you to say, I'm intentionally doing something that you don't know what it is. I know what is right. And there is a back door that you can always open. Sometimes it's the right tool, sometimes it's not. Uh, so for every feature, the question is, do we want to support it and make it official, or do we want to effectively say that this is an unsafe feature, you can still continue using this, but we believe that there are better patterns around this. For class eval and instance eval, we consider it unsafe. Uh, for reopening classes, we consider it safe. And survey natively supports finding all definitions that reopen a class, 
and being able to find all interfaces from them and method definitions. So it's similarly from experience of deploying this at Stripe and in other companies, we believe we found a balance where some of the features are natively supported, some of the features can be supported via backdoors. The question was, do we enable Sorbet in, your test suite, in our test suite? So Sorbet has two components. I didn't go deep into this in slides, but in, I, I dive deeper into the questions. Sorbet has runtime component and static component. Static component is a static type checker. It runs as a concurrent job in, your, in our CI. And if your code doesn't type check, it can't be merged. Uh, for in tests, we have also runtime component that verifies whether your types are correct in runtime and run it in both CI and production and development everywhere. Ah, the question was whether we check the types of our tests. Uh, mm. The question is funny because we didn't intend to. We grew experience from Facebook and Dropbox who did not type check their tests. Uh, our users went to type check their tests for themselves. So our team, like the majority of this talk starts with saying, you should go and do this yourself for your users. Our users at some point found it so useful that they wanted the same features to work with tests. And they made it work. So some tests do. We still don't officially require it. But nor, nor we like encourage or prohibit it. The thing about tests is we find that tests are frequently more fragile. And thus, sometimes type system is not the thing that you want. In particular, if you're like stubbing out stuff and type system doesn't want to model this. In particular, because our type system models what happens in production. And sometimes tests change the thing to not do the thing that production does in an incompatible way. It's increasingly rare, but existing tests do this. And thus, our type system is the thing that most closely mimics production, and some tests don't want it to, so those tests are not type checked. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for a great question. Yeah. Uh, in the back, please. Yeah, thank you for a great question. The question was, does Sorbet have interfaces? As in, would you be able to say that this is like some structure that you want multiple classes to implement and thus follow? Uh, Ruby has something called modules, which, is, which we use as interfaces. So you, we extended this to, de to define notion of abstract methods. You can say that this is a module which has a method, and this method we describe as abstract in the signature, and we will prohibit classes from instanti being instantiated both in runtime and statically unless they implement all their abstract methods. This effectively allowed us to have interfaces. We had this pretty early. Uh, more recently, around four months ago, we implemented a notion of sealed also, where not only you can define interface, you can also define interface that knows every class that implements it. And when you pattern match over it, we can do exhaustiveness checking. They do handle all of them. So yeah, interfaces are super awesome. We're using them a lot. They're a great feature. Thank you for a great question. More questions, please. Yes, please. Uh, I may have missed this earlier. Uh, what is, is the type checker implemented in Ruby itself, or it is? The, uh, the question was, what the type checker implemented in Ruby itself? The answer is no. Uh, the run type type system is a Ruby library. It works on baseline normal Ruby. It doesn't need any, any patches. You can use it in any Ruby code base. The static type system is a separate program that's written in C++. Uh, the reason it being written in C++ is from my prior experience working on compilers. I believe that the thing that defines performance of compilers is good work on memory locality. Compilers effectively have a bunch of core data structures that are huge hash maps. And the thing that will define whether you're fast or not is whether you can quickly find stuff there. Thus, the thing that's important for you is not your CPU performance. It's not how many threads you have. It's how much memory you can read through your CPU and how much memory do you waste reading through your CPU. So we chose a language which allows us to control for memory layout. The original team all knew C++. A lot of existing type checkers slash compilers have built a lot of tools for them. And we just built on them. And in retrospect, we believe this was the right choice. It also allowed us to compile to WebAssembly and have a very nice website, but at the time we didn't consider this as part of the choice. But like, the website was built on a plane to Japan, and it sounds awesome, and it's awesome, so it was super easy. 
Uh, more questions, please. Yes, please. Uh, how, how does this work with existing like Ruby gems? And is there a mechanism to provide like external path definition? Great question. So the question was, uh, with Ruby having libraries, the way how Ruby calls it being gems, uh, how do we type check something that calls methods into gems? Uh, the answer being, um, Stripe had a different solution for this, which is we actually monorepo the majority of the things, but the other companies didn't. So Shopify and Coinbase independently build a way to write an RBI as an interface file for a gem. Uh, at this moment, I believe majority of people in open source are, including Shopify, are converging on using the one implemented by Coinbase. You can point it into a gem and it will generate you a type signature for it. Majority of the times are going to be just untyped because it can't guess it. But the idea is that given a gem, you, you will get the skeleton. And then if you want to type, go ascribe types to some methods, you can go do this manually, commit you to your code control, and upstream it to a common repository that's called survey typed, where companies uh, uh, like commit, exchange those type of interfaces between each other. All of those is built by Coinbase. They did an awesome job. All of this is open source. Oh, yeah, cool. Yep. Awesome. More questions? Question. Yes, please. Um, would, are there any advantages to using this like, this project over like, Coinbase? Like, the question was, are there any advantages for using this in a new project over type language? It's a tricky question. The question is, Do you want to have the same code base where people can be both strict and YOLO in different ends? This is the value proposition for new code bases. And somebody may want this, somebody may not. So like some companies decide to, let's say, write a prototype in one language, say Python, but write the actual implementation in another language, say C++. The value proposition here is that you can go from YOLO to strict while staying in the same code base. Now, there might be other reasons why, as part of migration, you may decide to choose a different language, let's say performance. Uh, but at the current situation, the value proposition basically is this, if you're starting a new project. Another one, which I don't think matters for a new project, but this is an interesting consideration if you intend to have a big company. I don't think anybody is in this situation thinking as far along, but like, to the best of my knowledge, this is the fastest ID integration and the fastest type checker that I know about for a practical language. And thus, if you ever intend to have a code base in million lines of code, uh, like, let's put it this way, RubyMine in our code base takes a few minutes to start and, and like double or triple digit seconds to do all good, jump to definition. Uh, RubyMine has pretty much the same performance for Ruby and Java here, like they use the same infrastructure for them. So, the question is, probably if you're starting a new com a small company, you, you shouldn't include in your planning like how are you going to work in tens of million lines of code. Uh, but this is something that is also a unique proposition for this project. At the same time, I feel like there are like 10 companies in the world who care about it. Yep. Uh, the question was, how do we get the, the, the such fast performance? Uh, I did a talk about this on JVM Language Summit. It's available in the, on the internet. The short summary is the most important tool for you is uh, memory locality. And knowing what you want to do can define data structures that work well memory locality-wise for specific transformations that are performance sensitive. And at the same time, you want to encode enough extension points because some people will want you to, to extend you. And you want to make sure that when they extend you, your performance still stays, still, still stays good. So it's a balance between having the things entirely locked down where performance matter and doing very good data structures for it. And data structures designed around not the common things of CPU performance. There is entire algorithm theory study called external memory algorithms. And those are the algorithms where you'll be solving a problem. How do I so sort a petabyte of data given a single computer which has a gigabyte of memory? 
you effectively have the same question between your CPU caches and your memory. Because when you read, when you intend to write a, read a single byte from your memory, you actually read an entire row from the actual RAM into your cache. And this capacity, this throughput, is the one that you want to utilize fully. So short answer is there, there is a set of algorithms, which is external memory algorithms, that if you study from there, you'll be able to write software that uses caches effectively. And with our contemporary hardware having many layers of caches, if you use them effectively, you have like 10x speed ups, 100x speed ups. Does this answer your question? Awesome. Any more questions? Yes, please. Uh, I was at like, RubyConf two years ago, maybe, and there was a couple talks about type checking Ruby. Do you feel like this is becoming a standard that will be adopted industry, adopted industry wide, or is it just like you love it and you wrote it? OK, so the question was uh, the attendee was at RubyConf previous year or the year before? Two years ago. Two years ago and um, the question is, does this become a standard? Do other companies, are other companies adopting this? Uh, I'm presenting a talk in Ruby Company in a week, and there's a separate track on typing with uh, me opening the track and then Shopify presenting this, their, their experience, and then one of core Ruby committers presenting the, his tool that works with typing. So I think the stance here is uh, this is one of the tools that Ruby companies, Ruby communities can decide to use. In some cases, this is a tool that's beneficial. In particular, we strongly believe that this is a beneficial tool in a code base that's big, where notion of interfaces is useful, being explicit is useful, and setting up explicit expectations is useful. It's also super good when you want to you discover it through the code base. Uh, that said, this tool doesn't stop untyped Ruby from existing. There are, I, there are use cases where companies benefit from having like a super magical DSL that like just solves 90% of their business problem in this DSL. And making it, getting rid of this DSL for sake of type checking or trying to support it is just not worth it. So my belief is in many companies it's useful. I don't believe it's universally useful for everybody. There are some use cases where there is something that survey would not like that might be better for you, and maybe you choose the other one. Yeah, I guess I was more asking about, like, so, yeah, type checking is good or not, depending on your use case, but, like, Sorbet specifically, it seems like it's used by a lot of the big companies. Do you envision this solution to type checking being becoming a standard, or are there other competing alternatives that you also think are really good? Okay, so... The, the question was about, not specifically about type checking, but this implementation of type system for Ruby. For context, the other implementations of type checking for Ruby are RDL, which is a result of the work at Academia of Jeff Foster and his lab for around 15 years. Uh, there is work by, called Steep by Sotaro Matsumoto, done be mixed with Matt, who is creator of Ruby. It's a different person who just happens to have the same name. Uh, and there has been a project by GitHub called Type to Ruby. And there has been a project by IntelliJ folks. I don't think it had the public name. Uh, the current state is RDL is suggesting to use us if you want something production ready. They're doing research. They're good. Uh, Steep is uh, suggesting to use us if you want something that's fast. Um, I don't know what's happening with the uh, IntelliJ one. I think their thing was more similar to uh, feedback-driven profiling, where they're not statically doing it. Rather, they're gathering feedback from the tests and crowdsourcing from everybody. So I think they synergize with each other, where you can use that tool to infer types for us and vice versa. Um, so the basic question is, one is really, the RDL is really good in the sense it has advanced language features that we don't. You can express complex types, you do type level computations. Um, you can do proofs. You can have your types access your database and do logic based on that. Um, while our, but the disadvantage that comes is, is, is type checking speed is around 80 lines per second. So sometimes this is the better tool, sometimes the other is the better tool. The, we're all working together. The, we're all part of Ruby Types Working Group for Ruby 3. All of these people who I listed are in the same meeting uh, every month, where depending what's the set of use cases is that you want to handle, different one of them work better. The experience so far is we're the only one that has IDE support. We're substantially faster than the others. 
That said, we're less expressive than the others. Now the question is, do you value having a smaller language, but which is supported better, or do you want to be able to do type level type computations? And sometimes the not using survey and using something else is a better answer for you. Thank you for a great question. And yep, more on RubyConf. <laughs> Any more questions? Awesome. Thank you for following my talk. Have a great day.